So um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, today we have Professor Juan Ochoa, who's going to be speaking about his uh, books today and uh, how he feels about writing, what writing can do for you. Um, I am Heather Bobberwitz. I'm the programming librarian from uh, STC Library, so I'm here to assist. But that's about it. I'm going to turn it over to Professor Ochoa. Let me go back to presenter camera. And yep, you are. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming out. <laughs> I really, really appreciate this robust crowd. I really, really do. Um, yeah, Heather, like Heather said, my, my name is Juan Ochoa. Um, she introduced me as Professor Juan Ochoa, which is kind of accurate, but still very weird for me to hear, right? Because I had a uh, um, a very non-traditional, let's say it that way, <laughs> a non-traditional route to uh, becoming a, an English major, a, 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 a professor, a, a, an academic, a, a writer, right? None of this was planned. None of this was, um, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I, you know, I never dreamed of being a writer or a professor or, or, or an English major. I didn't even know that there was a such thing as an English major. When I was in college and and my professors always would ask me what I was majoring, and I would say, oh, I'm, I don't know, I'm just trying to get through. And they say, they would tell me, like, why don't you major in English? And I would tell them, because I already speak English, like this guy, you know, <laughs> what's wrong with them? You know, why would I want to do that? Because I thought that, that, you know, that was all there was, was ESL, because I used to live in Mexico for, um, a, a long time. When I graduated high school, I um, I I was living on the border, and um, I went to Reynosa and met a girl. And my father was working there, and I, I just kind of stayed. And instead of like coming back across, I kept on going further south. I was in Reynosa, then Monterrey, then I found myself in in uh, in central Mexico and. And, um, and you know, just things evolved from there. And, um, sorry, <laughs> just things evolved from there. Um, and my father, who is this man right here standing behind me, they're sitting behind me, and those are my twins. They're in their 30s now. My father is um, resting in peace, I hope. Right? <laughs> he might be turning in his grave right now. Um, but that's him, and that's his 38 Super with only three serial numbers, um, which means it was one of the first thousand Colt made back in 1911. That was his prized possession. And my father wasn't a drug dealer, right? My father was a drug lord. There's a big difference, right? My uh, my father was able to build a, a criminal enterprise um, to the size of which they were able to fix the presidency of Mexico in 1988. And you might sit there and go like, oh, wow, well, you know, politics and that happens. So, no, it doesn't. It's That's a really complicated thing to do. And, and, uh, and you know, to be able to say, you know, that he fixed the, um, the, the president's presidential elections of the 13th largest economy of the world, one of you know, the United States' largest trading partner and neighbor, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big thing to, um, uh, to do. So yeah, my father was able to build this big old empire, but of course it was all founded on a, on a house of cards, right? And um, it all came crumbling down, of course, you know, um, at, at the end. And you know, and that's kind of what I write about here in in, in Marijuana. But the the thing is that when all this was going on and everything was crumbling around us, um, I had to kind of like go into hiding. And my uh, we my family owned property in Mexico, and and you know, so I was able to you know jump from one house to another and things. And I and I found myself in this uh, uh, ranch in Hacienda that my father bought. In uh, in Guanajuato, in the Bajio state of Guanajuato, 
And I was working there. There was only one phone in the town. And when I would go and I would speak to my family, the people from the, from, it was a caseta. You, you go and you, you make a phone call and they time you and then they charge you for whatever. And they would hear me speaking English. Well, it turns out that the people who owned the phone were also part of Mexico's equestrian team. Go like <laughs> where you know they have an equestrian team. They, they fly, you know, horses around the world and stuff like that. Like you know, who does that? I didn't. I didn't even know that. But uh, again, you know, I had a a very uh, isolated world and an isolated realm. I didn't know these things that happened out. You know, outside the the realm of you know police chiefs and DAs and judges and governors and even presidents and stuff like that and, and you know everybody making illicit money and stuff I didn't know that there was you know sports and hobbies and things like that other than you know the normal right baseball football things like that right so anyway these people needed somebody to sponsor them right because it's expensive to fly a person well imagine flying a horse right and they had to go to Cuba for the Havana games the, the, the Pan American games were being held in Havana that year and and they needed a substitute. They, they had a professor at, at the Tec de Monterrey who taught English as a second language. And they would sponsor them, but they wanted to go. And they couldn't go unless they had a substitute. So they said, you speak English. Why don't you become the substitute? And I was like, well, no. <laughs> yeah, I don't, you know, no. Uh, and I, by this time, I had studied law in Mexico, right? So I've, I've become, I was, you know, about to pass my bar exam, but um, um, of course I couldn't, you know, schedule my bar exam. I couldn't even finish the last classes of of uh, of my um, of my graduation um, courses. Right? They called them graduation. But I couldn't even finish those. Or if I did, I would go sporadically. All right, I couldn't go every day because. Well, I had the federal police looking for me. I had other gangs looking for me. I had, you know, there, there was, there, there, there was, you know, danger around. So I couldn't go to class like every other student. And uh, um, so, you know, I, you know, I was in between taking the exam and stuff like that. But lawyers don't educate, right? We like people to be ignorant. So, so then we can take advantage of them and use big words and that they don't understand, and then they give us money, and then we walk away and we take everything, <laughs> right? So, so no, I didn't want to be a teacher. I didn't want to be an instructor. I didn't want to be a professor or anything like that. But I was hungry and I didn't have any money. And, you know, the uh, the avenues for for income had dried up for us. So, uh, and but yet the expense was still there. We still had a lot of expense and everything. So I decided, okay, I'll go in there and I'll substitute teach um, for a couple of weeks. That turned into something like five, six, seven years, right, that I, the, that I did that. And um, and I couldn't rise up from the level of of, of you know English professor because um, I didn't have a master's degree. I only had a law degree, and I went and I took my bar and everything like that. So I was able to work, and I was able to work for the Tec de Monterrey, and things were going um, pretty well. But then the devaluation hit, the economy went bust, you know, all my neighbors were leaving and they were all telling me, you know, you need to get out of here. You're stupid. You're just a pendejo. You, you should be uh, going to the United States. You speak English. You have papers. You know, what are you doing here? And I held out for as long as I could until I, I finally did. I, you know, I, um, I, um. Uh, I went back to the States and that was because, well, by this time, my first wife had left me. Um, and my second wife, who we hadn't been married, we hadn't gotten married yet. She had just gotten out of jail. Yeah. That. <laughs> my first wife I met at a courthouse. She was a lawyer and, um, um, and we met there and, you know, we, we got married and, and uh, had the twins. And of course, when, you know, everything started to hit the fan, she left me and, and, you know, took the kids but I had my dad was in jail in Reynosa, and and so was my second wife. She was in there, but she was in there for trafficking and stuff. And and, uh, and she was a very remarkable woman because um, as far as females in the drug trade go, she broke a lot of glass ceilings. You know, she had the capacity to go up a mountain in Mexico with a bag full of money and come down uh, with a bag full of weed. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's actually a very dangerous thing to do. And, and uh, but my wife was like that. And, but unfortunately, she died of, uh, five years ago. But um, 
but she got out of jail and she met my she ran into my father um and you know he put me on the phone with her and she you know she called me and she was like you know what are you doing i told her i'm teaching english and she asked me well do you still have clients and of course i do and she said well i can get merchandise well let's work so we, I came back to the United States and I started doing what I'd always done, right? That was the only thing that I knew how to do, actually, right? Um, I was doing all right as an English instructor. I was actually even learning the rules, right? But the students would ask me, like, you know, why do you say an elephant instead of a elephant? And I would tell them, because it sounds better. <laughs> because that's what it is. And, you know, I didn't know that there was rules that, you know, you couldn't have two vowels together and things. And, you know, over time, the, the internet started to, to kick in, right? They actually took us to a room and told us, look, you know, uh, you're going to be able to talk from this computer to that computer. And, and uh, it's called email and stuff like that. And you know, there's this thing now that's called the World Wide Web. And, and we're all, you know, oh, really, you know, this thing. So um, I was able to start learning things. And I was starting to be able to learn up grammar rules and, and stuff like that. So I was getting there. But the salary wasn't really... Um, um, covering my bills and, and things like that. And, uh, and I was pretty lonely down there. So, um, you know, she calls me and we end up coming over and we end up working and we're moving and we're shaking and we're grooving and we're making money and stuff like that. But I'm worried, right? Because we don't do anything all day, but sit around and wait for phone calls and dress really, really nice and put on a lot of perfume and go to the mall and spend a lot of money. And that's all we're doing. And I'm worried about the neighbors. And I'm thinking, you know, what, what's, what's, uh, what are the neighbors going to think? And I'm living like right off of 10th Street, McAllen, and I'm moving industrial quantities of everything. And and um, and I see that everybody in the parking lot has an STC parking sticker. And I say, that's it. I'll enroll, I'll take a few classes, I'll get the parking sticker. When the neighbors see, they'll like, okay, well, he's a student. You know, that's why he has weird hours. That's why he's always carrying backpacks. That's why, you know, perfect plan, right? Yeah, right. No such thing. It's a perfect plan. So I start taking the classes. I start doing well. Next thing you know, I get a letter and it says, congratulations, you've made the dean's list. What is that? What is a dean's list? You know, any list that I'd ever been on was not a good thing, right? So I'm like, you know, no, no, no. What? Well, you know, something's wrong here. So me and my wife were looking at this letter. We don't know what it is, and and uh, but she says it says congratulations. So it's not a bad thing. Go and um and see what they tell you. So they go and they come to Pecan campus. We go to H building. They have tables set up. They're giving us donuts and little pins and velvet cases. And and next thing you know, this um, woman comes walking in and she's dressed immaculately. Every hair is in place. Every stitch of clothing is right where it should be. And she's going through and she's shaking everybody's hands. She's telling them something and she's coming towards me and I'm scared, right? Here's this woman, you know, coming at me and, you know, every, the, the, everybody, the, the crowd is partying in front of her like it was the Red Sea. She's obviously somebody important. We're like, oh, she was the president of the school. It was Shirley Reed, right? And she comes up to me and she says things. She tells me something that I've never heard before in my life. Uh, she shakes my hand and she tells me, I am proud of you. And that is something I'd never heard of because when you bring a load down from a mountain or you get a load across the river or you get something to Houston and you get paid, Nobody says, I'm proud of you. <laughs> Everybody just says, like, take the money and run. Be careful. They're going to kill you. They're going to, you know, you're going to get arrested. You're going to get this. You're going to get that. And you really can't celebrate any of your accomplishments when you're doing any of, uh, of the things that I was doing. And, like, you know, she, you know, she said those words. I never heard them before. And it, it, it really made an impact on me. And I, and I went home and I told my wife, I said, you know, I told her what had happened. They gave me a pin. They gave me a donut. And this lady came in and said she was proud of me. And my wife said, oh. Damn, right? Uh, Cause she knew also, right? At, at this time, we're living in a fifth world trailer and in a, in a senior citizen trailer park. I don't know how, but we did. <laughs> and uh, the bathroom is literally stacked to the gills, you know, like taller than me, full of you know marijuana, and and um, and you know I've got nothing going for me at all, but I have this you know powerful woman telling me that she's proud of me. Right. So I literally, we sold everything that we had. Um, I quit doing that. I, I started 
cleaning out offices, scrubbing toilets, selling beer at the stadium, uh, and kept on, you know, I didn't even know that there was such a thing as financial aid. I, 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 I went actually to tell my professors that I, that I had to quit because I didn't have any money. And they, they asked me about financial aid and I told them, I don't even know where my mom lives, right? I said, I don't have anybody to give me money or anything like that. And, uh, and they're like, no, no, FAFSA and the government and this and that. And, and, and again, you know, growing up like this, you don't really want to have anything to do with the government. You know, I've literally had no record whatsoever other than my, my birth certificate, my social security number, and now a college transcript, right? I, I didn't have anything, no work history, no, my social security number had never been used, or at least not by me. Um, um, so, you know, I, I didn't know anything about the, the, the outside world. So anyway, short story long, um, I get the financial aid, I go through the classes, I graduate with a bachelor's, um, I, I keep going, you know, um, for the master's, I, I wind up getting teaching jobs, but every time I would run into somebody from my past, um, they would always ask me the same thing. You know, what are you doing now? Do you do you have clients? Do you have this? Do you have that? You know, something illegal. They would always invite me to do something illegal, and I would tell them, "No, I don't do that anymore. I you know, I teach English. I'm, I'm I'm a professor," and they would always tell me the same thing. Do they know who you are? Do they know where you come from? Do they know? Like they were going to go and out me, right? They were like kind of trying to like, like hold this over me, right? And I don't like to feel that way. I don't like to feel threatened. I don't like to feel cornered. I don't, I, I uh, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a kid. I grew up in barrios. I, I, you know, you don't back down even if you get beat up, right? So I got really sick and tired of people, you know, trying to hold this over me, trying to, um, like, trying to blackmail me, trying, like, you know, I'm going to out you. I'm going to do the secret. So I wrote the book. Right. And, you know, now when they ask me, you know, do they know who you are? Do they know where you come from? I say, yes, my bosses have even bought the book. I've signed it for them. You know, I get presentations on this and uh, um, and everything. Right. So, um, you know, that was that was, you know, what caused me uh, to to write this and to explain my side of the story. You'd think that people would be satisfied with that, right? I mean, come on, how many people, you know, write a book or, you know, especially who come back from, you know, my my background and things like that. I figured, okay, write the book. People will shut up, leave me alone. Let me get on down the road and, and that'll be that. Oh, no, 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 no. Because then they developed a, a false image of, of my family that, you know, we're just a bunch of criminals and we never did anything right. And, we never, and that that is not true. You know, my father worked very, 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 very hard. But, you know, my father was 12 years old when he crossed uh, over to this side. And he was immediately the next day picking 400 pounds of cotton a day, right? At, at 12 years old, my father worked very, very hard. He met my mother in the in the fields of Weslaco and... Um, um, you know, they got married and they built a family and, and, and he worked for over 30 years um, at, at everything that you can imagine. He worked in the fields, he managed a dairy, he worked in a lumber yard, he worked in an ice house, he worked in a bakery. Uh, he said he loved the job at the bakery because he never went to bed hungry, right? Um, and, uh, and I knew exactly what he was talking about because um, no matter what we were doing, no matter how much money we were making, there was always fear and hunger. Those were always the the, the, the major sentiments, right? Um, so I, I didn't want people to have that image of my father and my family that, that were, you know, just a bunch of criminals, a bunch of, um, you know, maliantes or, or anything like that. So I wrote the next book, Al Otro Lado. And, um, um, and that's kind of, you know, it's the prequel to Marijuana. And I'm... Um, um, I go back five generations to narrate the events that provoked my family um, from to to come to uh, America because my family didn't come to America because they wanted a better life or they were looking for opportunity like you know like the nice people say about immigrants 
or they do want to get on welfare, they want to take advantage of the government, like the not so nice people say about immigrants, right? There was nothing like that. My family had land, my family had position, they, um, but my family also had a great grandfather who had a 35 year affair with a woman, with a married woman. And uh, that became, that got complicated after a while. And, um, you know, Offenses were made and honor had to be retaken and people got killed and and uh, and well my grandfather ended up having to come to the United States and my father ended up following after him and uh, um, and you know they met in the, the whole sequence uh, uh, of, of events but the thing is that okay these are my stories this is the story of my family and many of you who live down here in the valley or wherever you're from, you have similar stories. There, There's uh, skeletons in all of our closets. There's things that that, that um, we've heard our parents, you know, talk about um, in hushed whispers and, and you know, um, always ended with, I'm oh, just a leader. <laughs> right? Uh, you know, I grew up hearing, hearing those types of things. And the thing about it is that that whenever I would ask about things like this or, or you know, why did this happen or, or you know, how come we did, ended up doing this or that, I was always told the same thing, shut up, don't say anything, we don't talk about that. And it always messed with my head of why we didn't talk about that because I knew that that was the reason we were so messed up, right? And I, and I, really thought that that was important for um, not only for me to figure out, uh, but for my children, my, my daughters to figure this out. And, um, and then I started to, to realize that my story wasn't as unique as I thought it was, that a lot of people um, uh, grew up the way I did, uh, um, maybe not on the scale of, of what, my, you know, what my father was doing, uh, because like I said, I have yet to meet anybody that has done things to the scale that that my old man was doing. He uh, really, really did some remarkable things as far as trafficking is concerned, <laughs> right? Um, which again, you're not going to get into the Guinness Book of World Records or, or or anything like that. No one's going to come and pat you on the back for that. But um, it was pretty remarkable, um, especially for the fact that my father had a fourth grade education and he... Um, you know, he was able to build this empire, but of course, he wasn't able to keep it. Thank you. Hey, come in. Where's your plane? Okay, come on in. <laughs> All right. And um, so, so, um, so, yeah, I, uh, um, I, you know, I had to like kind of like fill in the gaps for the story, and and I went back, you know, five five generations, and I'm going to read to you from. Um, I love her loud now. Um, I'm going to read. I'm, I'm really not really sure what to read. Um, but I think I'll, I'll read to you. Um, I think I'll read to you how they met. If I could find it. <laughs> Yeah, here it is. And um, it's kind of weird because, um, you know, I have to describe these characters, right? I have to build these characters and I have to build an image and stuff like that. And um, um, my kids always freak out on the description of my mom. Right of, of the mom character over here, and they're like, "Dad, you know how you describe your mom?" But you gotta understand, uh, my mom was a remarkably beautiful woman, remarkably beautiful. Like you know, every woman envied her, every man desired her. You know, there was uh, um, not a head that wouldn't turn when she walked by, and she knew it. And that's really hard to capture in a character, right? To, to, to make it sound like that. And the thing about it is that my father was the same way, right? My father, you know, whenever he'd walk into a room, all heads would turn, you know, wherever he would walk, very charismatic, you know, how they made this ugly creature standing before you. I do not know. <laughs> but uh, they were, they were, you know, quite, quite the couple, right? So I think it's worth, you know, 
knowing how how they got together, right? So here it goes. This is how they met. Marianne Chavez was the most beautiful woman ever to work in the fields. It's possible that she could have been the most beautiful woman in the world if some Hollywood producer had discovered her. But even in obscurity, Marianne, or Anita, which was favored over her given name, was desired by every man who laid eyes on her and envied by every woman she met. She met. There wasn't anything singularly remarkable about her, although you could not find an imperfect feature on her either. On top, firm and perky that could barely fill a man's hand, but more than a few fell face first in the furrowed fields, trying to get a peek down her shirt to see but a glimpse of the velvet flesh of her darling breast. She had a slender waist, curved, shapely hips, and firm yet not too ample glutes that filled out her denim work pants that zipped on the side like a shell. Anita was not tall, but far from being a flaw, her size was, was more proof of how extraordinarily attractive she was. It was as if God made her a compact five and a half feet tall so that people could take in her whole frame in one breathtaking glance, a sort of gift to mankind like the rainbow the Lord presented to Noah. It was that, the whole picture, the whole image of Anita that made her so beautiful. From head to toe, she was grace personified. Not one to get too friendly with the other field hands, Anita rarely had conversations with any one person. When she did speak, it was to everyone at once. Her discourse was sharp and pointed and sliced almost painlessly and so effortlessly that the tiny cuts her tongue made were a pleasure to endure and only stunned and ached when she stopped talking. Her father was the first Mexican-American to own a business in Edinburgh, and not just any, anywhere in Edinburgh. Don Alfredo's Mexican cuisine was located right on the main plaza by the courthouse and the Citrus Movie Theater. Judges and lawyers ate there. Don Alfredo did such a thriving business that Anita never lacked any of the finer things a girl could desire. Ruffled panties, silky socks, shiny shoes, nice dresses, and cute shorts for the summertime. But then when she was in the middle of her 10th year of grade school, so close to finishing and be able, being able to enter college and then become a doctor, her father ran away with their housekeeper, leaving the fam family penniless. There was work in the fields picking cotton, so Anita and her mother and sisters all got jobs. She missed her old life, but knew she would somehow get it back. What bothered her were the things that could never be again, like playing in the high school band. She missed playing cumbias on her clarinet when Mrs. Winnie left the room. She could never be part of anything like that now, and that hurt her. The past was gone and the present was miserable, but the future was still there, and she knew it was just time and nothing more. And now it just happened to be a bad time. There would be better, although deep down inside she feared there would not. Unbeknownst to Anita, but only minutes away, there was a man. <laughs> At 18, Julio Cortina could tear down the whole world and build it back up again, but didn't out of pity for those who couldn't be as great as him. Last night, he almost broke this rule he made by tearing through the town of Westlaco. It was the dark days of summer, and instead of withering in the blazing heat like everyone else, Julio had himself a time. The day started off ordinary enough. The work truck blared its horn at quarter to five, and thanks to an unseasonal heavy dew that morning that made the cotton moist and heavy, Julio had his 400 pounds picked by noon, so he hit the town determined to buy a $1.98 dress shirt south of the tracks in the Lado Americano of Weslaco. He strolled down the shaded walk as conspicuously as he could, stopping to look in each window and taking the display from as many angles in his body as as body could contort. He was just about to purchase a fine white shirt with light blue pinstripes when Mundo Galvan came up and asked him if he knew anybody who could cross his family from El Otro Lado. How many people are we talking about here? Five, three men and two ladies. One of the men is real old, Mundo said in a hushed voice, trying to escape the noise, the notice of the gringa sales lady. That's going to cost you 35 Americanitos, Julio said coyly. $35? I'm not asking for you to walk them across the bridge, Mundo protested. Yeah, I know, but the current is swift, and I'm going to need some help with the old guy and the ladies, and that's, and that's supposing the other pendejos can swim. <laughs> Julio said smoothly, knowing that no one could do the job as well as he could at any price. Mundo agreed, so Julio instructed him to gather the group and meet him at the river's edge by the Twisted Mesquite on the, on the Mexican side. Julio went and found his older brother, Ines, and told him of the group that was willing to pay to be brought across. How much, Ines said greedily. 
two bucks a head. So we get five bucks each? Well, you've got that all wrong, Ines said matter-of-factly. Before Julio could defend his offer, Ines continued, I'm going, I'm getting six dollars and you're getting four because I have the inner tubes we'll need to get those people across. Julio stood with his mouth agape, which only causing them to bellow with laughter. You, you have to get up mighty early to get the better of your big brother, Julio. Don't you ever forget that. Julio shrugged and shrugged and said, you got me this time. Now let's get them tubes and get to work. They put the ladies on the tube on a tube each and made their husbands swim alongside during the crossing. Julio laid the old man belly up across the inner tube and guided his car, cargo gently along with the current. Ines swam ahead and was out of the water before Julio could get the first of the rafts to shore. He had to abandon his charge while he sliced through, through the water and caught up with the ladies tubes and got them on the bank. The old man was frantic when Julio came back for him, but otherwise safe. Inez took the whole scene from the bank, clutching his sides and slapping his knees in over-dramatized mockery. mockery. It was still an easy trip and Julio got paid well for it. He bought his shirt and had dinner at a place that had napkins made of stiff cloth. Then he hit the cantina from end to end. He did tequila shots with beer chasers at the bar. He snorted cocaine in the bathroom and smoked marijuana behind the building with a bunch of broke customers where the tips of their cigarette made a scandalous glow with each deep inhale. He ambled home in the darkest of night and had only closed his eyes for what seemed like an instant when the work truck blared its horn. In his haste not to miss his ride, Julio had to put on his good shoes without any socks. He made it back to the back of the truck just as it was pulling away, but was able to grab hold of the railing and hoist himself up. He boarded the truck clumsily and head first, but he managed to steady himself when his body bent at the waist and his face just inches away from Anita's wonderful eyes. <laughs> he looked into those eyes for only a split second and was asleep as soon as he found a space. But in that brief moment, moment that he held her gaze, Julio was overwhelmed with what a sensation that something joyous had just ended his life. In the minutes it took the truck to lumber to the fields, Julio dreamed with an entire life with Anita. Even before his eyelids had betrayed him and were half closed as he was sinking into sleep, he knew it was not that he had to have her, but, and most importantly, that no one else could have her. When the truck came to a dusty halt at the edge of a field, Julio was the first off, but he made time fidgeting with the two by four board the workers hitched to their belts where they fastened their sacks. Anita selected her rose to pick before he entered the field. He had to run off Oscar Lopez, but he got the rose next to Anita and set himself to ripping the cotton from its bowl at a feverish pace that, made, that he made look easy. He was well ahead of Anita when she looked up from the labor and get, with a gasp. Julio was encroaching on her rose and picking her cotton. She had, she had been startled on the truck when his face almost crashed into hers and would have given him an earful had he not looked so embarrassed and asked for pardon all the way to his seat. But to see him steal from, from her rose was now more infuriating. It was disrespectful. Anita hurried her pace and began to inch her way closer to where Julio had been picking her row. And then she saw the first of what would be many small piles of cotton picked and gathered for her just to stuff in her sack. There was still a vast distance between her and Julio, but she was able to gain ground quickly without the burden of actually picking the cotton. She finally caught up with Julio, but only because he was waiting for her at the end of the rows. She stomped up to him and got, got her face close enough to, to his to make his grin a little nervous. Why are you stealing my cotton, Anita demanded. I'm not taking it from you. I'm leaving it there for you so you won't have to bother, Julio said as casually as he could muster. Yeah, but how much are you putting in, into your sack before you make the piles, huh? It's bad enough that that Eusebio robs us of the scales, but now I have to guard my rose from a thieving mojadito, Anita said, throwing up her hands as she spoke. I'm not a mojado, Julio protested. He fumbled in his back pocket and pulled out a worn wallet. With hands shaking with fury, he forced out a shiny green card and exposed a small stack of crisp dollars. You see, I got papers. So? People with papers steal too, Anita said, trying hard not to smile. The fact that he had papers and was not just another undocumented field hand made her feel good, but not good enough to forget what had started her confrontation. Look, you pick your rose and let me pick my rose. Then we can all be robbed at the scales. We said it doesn't take that much. Just a few pounds from each sack so we can get something at the end of the day too, Julio said, trying to get a hold of the meeting. I don't worry too much about it because I've got things going on the side. 
I do all right for myself. Hulu had his chin stuck up so high, he momentarily lost sight of his desire standing right in front of him. He took a half step forward and looked at her hard. I can do enough for both of us. You certainly do, do for yourself, Anita said, backing away and turning to the fields. You do for yourself, Eusebio does for himself, and everyone takes my cotton. Anita looked at the, at the rows of cotton that laid ahead of her and felt the sting of the sun that would be in her face for several acres. A knot grew in her stomach. If I were a man, if I were a man, I wouldn't let Eusebio rob me of the scales. If I were a man, I wouldn't let you nowhere near my rose. I don't know why you're so mad, Julio said, catching up to Anita before she could get to work. I just wanted to get your attention so I could tell you something. What? Julio stiffened his back and said with all the sincerity he knew, me gustas para la madre de mis hijos. Anita shrieked, you want me to have your children? I've heard some lines before, but yours has to be the craziest. Julio's face burned with rage. Who's been talking to you about such things? Eusebio? Anita looked at the stern look on Julio's face and the vein on his neck that was pulsating and didn't know whether to laugh or run. She pushed past him and took to her rose. Julio fell in behind her, but was soon well ahead and was still picking Anita's rose and leaving behind piles of cotton. The whole time he, keep, he kept running their talk through his head, looking for signs of interest. He couldn't believe it, but he felt doubt that he might have not impressed her. Most girls withered with just a coquettish glance. Why was she different? Why didn't she gush over him? Could there be someone else? She kept talking about Eusebio. Was she interested in him? No, she hated him. She thought he was a thief. Now that he thought about it, Eusebio was a pinch of thief. He got a check from working the scales. He was skimming from each side. Only a few pounds. It seemed too petty a thing to even consider before today. He stopped and looked over his shoulder and gave Anita his most dashing smile, but she just sucked her teeth and picked cotton as fast as she could. He waited for her at the end of the row, but she trudged past him and with her chin leading the way to the truck where, where the scales were. She lugged her sack of, of cotton up to Osevio, who snatched it up and emptied it on the scale. The brass arm on the scale raced up to raced to 56 and came to a bobbing stop on 54. Eusebio announced, 50. How many? Anita asked incredulously. You heard, Eusebio said without looking up from his ledger. But the words hardly escaped his lips before Julio was on the truck, swinging the two by four that the workers hitched to their belts so they could hang their sacks. The board slapped Eusebio stingingly across the face as Julio let out a, a guttural, guantas. Julio brought the board up again high over his head before he said he studied. I, I, I mean, 54. Julio let the board fall, fall, fall again, but had to change its trajectory to avoid the fallen one's defensive arm and settle for, thudding, for a thudding whack up to the ribs. How many? I saw 60. It was 60. It was 60, Eusebio pleaded, fumbling over the ledger and showing Julio the corrected sum. Julio said, towering over the gaping mouths of the other field hands who had gathered to witness the spectacle. Julio snatched the leather from Eusebio and declared to all who could hear, I'll be running the scales now since Eusebio fell and hurt himself. Anyone got a problem with that? A murmured ripple went through the crowd as Eusebio scrambled off the truck. Then someone handed Julio their sack and everyone fell into line. Anita stood watching with keen interest. Without her realizing it, there was a smile spreading broadly across her lips. This one was different. He had a look. Sure, there was lust in his eyes like every other man, but Julio had something, determination. With the right administration, Julio could be someone in this world, Anita thought. Mm -hmm. Three weeks later, Anita was pregnant with the first of six children she would have a child with Julio. Wow. <laughs> so, that's... Uh, that's how they met, and that's how that's how this whole you know crazy ride got uh, got going. Right? That's you know that was the uh, um, the the first of, of six. I was the fifth, and um, I had to piece that story together from from uh, you know. I'd ask my mom, "How'd you meet my dad?" But he was stealing from me. You mean? <laughs> what she would say, oh, right? Yeah. And it was like, huh? And then I'd have to ask, like, you know, one of my aunts, one of her sisters. She, you know, she said, you know, I Anita tan chocante. You know, he wasn't stealing; <laughs> he was leaving the cotton there for her. But you know how she is. And and then uh, um, one time I was uh, riding with my dad. We were going to Houston, Dallas. I don't know where. We were doing something wrong, and. Um, 
and we passed by a field uh, and they were picking cotton and uh, and my dad said guantas and i was like what are you talking about and um and I asked him, I said, yeah, and he said, what is this Don Cuco? And I'm like, who's this Don Cuco you keep on beating it up? And he was like, no, you know, that's what I told the guy that was running the scales. And so now I had to do more investigating. I had to figure out. So a lot of these stories I had to piece together from a line here, a story here, because again, no one wanted to tell me the full version, right? So I had to take a lot of license, fill in the gaps and, and, and everything. Um, but, you know, there it is. And, and, um, and you know, it just goes on from there. I, I, uh, like I said, I, I really wanted people to know that the, you know, we just weren't uh, a bunch of criminals, right? You know, the, 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 um, you know, we have a history just like everybody else, right? And there's no reason to be ashamed of that history, right? No, um, no matter what um, uh, route it took, uh, you know, we're here, right? Everybody always asks me, like. You know, how were you able to escape that life? How were you able to leave that life? Running, it's not a life, right? The, the retirement plan is horrible, right? It's either death or jail. And, um, you know, I might not look like much right now, but in jail, I'm beautiful. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> be my friend in jail. So, and I don't like that, <laughs> right? So I didn't, I didn't, you know, um, I, you know, I saw my uncles, I saw my brothers, I, my, 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 my father, my wife, you know, go to jail. I, I didn't want that for me. I certainly didn't want it for my children. And I certainly don't want it for, for the, the people who come into my class. Uh, um, and, you know, and, and I, I want everybody to know that this is it right here, getting an education, right? And, my dad gave my brothers cars, houses, jewelry. I could have got all that too, um, but what I always kept on saying was, I want to go to college. I want to go to college. I want to go to college. One of the reasons I studied in Mexico was because we didn't know how to go to college in the United States, right? Uh, there was no one to tell us, you know, uh, because we're all first generation. You know, our parents, you know, my dad had a fourth grade education. My mom had to drop out of school at 10th grade, right? Uh, my mom would always, would always say, uh, had I gone to college for 11 years, I would have been a doctor. And we would always think, that's pretty much anyone, mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you do that, right? Um, uh, but, you know, she always lamented that. My father would always tell us that, too. Yo siempre tuve hambre de estudio, right? And these were very, very intelligent people, but, you know, they, 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 they you were never able to exploit that talent, and at least not in the right way, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, and what I found out that life is very, very complicated, right? It doesn't come with a manual. It doesn't come with instructions. Mm -hmm. But school, school, come on. They give you a syllabus. They tell you right there, look, if you do this, this way, at this time, you're going to pass. Mm -hmm. If you do it really good, you're going to get an A. If you get a lot of A's, they, they put... Latin words on your diploma, and they say, you know, magna cum laude and stuff like that, and, right? And they give you a, a special cord to wear at the graduation. But it's really neat. It really, really is, right? Uh, you know, uh, I hear this a lot, especially from people who don't got degrees. Do you think you're smart because you have a degree? Yes, I do. Not only do I think I'm smart, the regents at the school think I'm smart, the, the, you know, the, the powers that be, and they say so right there on the diploma, be it known to all men that this guy did it, right? And you guys can too, and you have to do that. Do not lose sight of that prize, right? Because everything was taken from us. The cars, I, I had a beautiful 66 Mustang, cherry red, four-speed top loader transmission. The feds took it and they gave me back the chassis. I mean, literally everything stripped out of it, right? All of that can go away, but what I learned in school, what I learned how to write, what, you know, that could never be taken from, right? And, um, and even more so, I, I set up a culture in my house, in my community of people to follow that, right? My nieces and my nephews started to go to college. My children all have degrees, right? This little girl works for the Supreme Court in Mexico. This little girl drives a Volvo. <laughs> 
Wow. <laughs> my youngest is, you know, managing a, a, a doctor's office, at, you know, at 25, and she's been doing it since she was 19. Mm -hmm. These are smart kids, and they, you know, got through school, and, and I wish I could say that I read to them every night, that I, you know, encouraged, I, I, I didn't. There was just, I was working 17 hours trying to get a master's, trying to get keep a job going. Uh, trying to work overtime, adjuncting, and stuff like that was very, 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 very difficult, but very, very worth it, right? And that's the only thing I haven't, you know, uh, lost. All the material things have gone, you know, the jewelry, the cars, the fancy clothes, um, the people in my life have, you know, drifted away. My wife, like I said, unfortunately died. Um, but she died with a master's. Right. Uh, um, and she was a social worker and she did, did a lot of things. And again, like I said, I met her in jail. Right. Uh, um, ours is not, you know, your typical boy meets girl, girl meets boy. Um, and they fall in love and live happily ever after. Although, you know, we did for, for, for a long time, but it was that it was the education. And, and I, one, one of the proudest things that the, that I've ever heard in my life came from my youngest daughter. And, um, um, cause we were gathering up, um, all the things after, after my wife passed and she said, I want the diplomas. Right. And, uh, well, my wife had a few, I have a few and, and, um, you know, she wants, she wants them and all. She says, because who would have thought that my mom and dad would be the poster children of education, right? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> we're usually on those posters of, you know, like this could happen to you and you're being led away <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, um, this is um, what caused me to write, write, write the book. Um, this is a, uh, what drove me to to keep studying, keep getting degrees, keep getting education, because I knew that that was uh, something that no one could, you know, ever take away from me. Uh, it was the best thing that I, the best inheritance I could ever give to my children, the best inheritance I ever got um, uh, from my father, and it's you know really, 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 really the um, the. The most worthwhile thing um, you're 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 ever going to do, right? Mm -hmm. So I thank you all for coming out. I, I hope you enjoyed the the presentation. I, I hope you can find a copy of the of the book, uh, Amazon bookstores, wherever wherever you can. If you ever see me, we got a copy of the book. I'll sign it for you. When I die, you can sell it for a dollar more on eBay. All right. Oh <laughs> so thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.